And it'd be good to really have a business model that is sustainable instead of relying long-term only on donations, which is a situation that Blender has found themselves in a favorable position for because they do have large corporate backing because they ultimately are kind of a standard. They're used as a benchmark by NVIDIA and AMD and Apple for all their hardware uh, and Intel. So those those companies back it because they want to see Blender be like the best on their own, <laughs> on their own hardware. But that's a, a position which maybe we can someday move ourselves towards, but I don't think that's something we can rely on. And that's going right. to take a very long time to reach that point. I also mentioned like we would act as a render server for render farms. That might be something where if we need to have like an orchestration system across a thousand different machines, we can maybe, because it's such a niche case that's only used by big companies, we could maybe charge for like that specific kind of orchestration system where no users need that, but we really are focused on keeping it anything, anything monetization wise, not shoved in some, in, not shoved in front of your face mm -hmm. ever. And also not in a way that detracts from the spirit of open source, because this is really what we're trying to build, build mm -hmm. while still being able to not only rely on donations longer term, but at the moment we rely entirely on donations because all of our eventual business model options can basically be things that we can't do in the next few years because they just require so much technological build out and also a sizable number of users before um, those become viable at all. Like the asset mm -hmm. store is probably the, the soonest one we could expect, but we still have to build a good amount of technology and we start have to actually start building a backend with hosting and infrastructure. We have no hosting at the moment. Um, when you go to Graphite, you are visiting just a CDN, just hosting static assets, mm -hmm. meaning that we don't have to pay for anything like that because it's free to host just purely a website with static assets. But as soon as you get servers and databases and uh, computation on the cloud, yeah. and then it becomes expensive. And of course, that's something that we'll have to be able to, um, to support and scale up and maintain balances and load. And it gets all very complicated in terms of both maintenance and cloud costs and things. Um, so that's going to be a transition that we probably are going to need to hire someone uh, to work on full time as mm -hmm. as part of their their uh, allowing us to go from what we're at now, it's just purely a client side application to eventually having those kinds of infrastructure for like the asset store and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that will be a, a transition up in the future. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of a, a word on business models and how we intend to make this project as big as it can possibly be towards you know, making that ambition realized. Well, since we're still uh, we're on the topic of business models, what is the actual structure of the organization that runs the project? Yeah, so basically we want to keep as little overhead as possible. So I've simply formulated an LLC or uh, um, organized an LLC that I'm the sole owner of, and that just allows us to have a bank account so I can, you know, buy like my flight here, for example, to Germany. I'm, I'm normally based in California. Um, and... Uh, so far, I've had to put in some mon some of my own money to uh, get us to this point, but I'm hoping to get that money back through donations. Um, and also Google Summer of Code um, gives both grants for our students to basically hire interns for us over the summer. Mm -hmm. And they also give our organization a bit of a stipend as well. So with that plus, intern uh, plus donations, um, I think this year we might very well be slightly positive instead of slightly negative like we were in previous years. But yeah, basically, I'm just the sole owner of the LLC, mm -hmm. and it's not really a company that's it's not really a, yeah a company that's run in a for-profit way. Even though technically it's not a non-profit, just because there's a huge amount of legal overhead right. and right. Uh, requirements and things to run that. And I am not a lawyer; I am a programmer <laughs> and I'm a designer, and I don't want to even think about any of that stuff. It's hard enough to just to just run the basic uh, stuff. But you know, we could always become. Some, some sort of non nonprofit foundation in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a matter of what kind of priorities make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. think right now the priority should be getting something that people are wanting to exactly. use and doesn't have a constantly changing file format. And, you know, I, I understand why you're in the position you're in. Like, it, it makes sense why you're doing it the way you are. Um, I know some people want it done perfectly from day one, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I totally understand why you're coming at it from the direction you are. Yeah, it's, it's back to that analogy of painting a painting and it takes a hundred years to paint a specific painting and you can either paint that hundred year painting square inch by square inch in its completed detail, mm -hmm. which is basically impossible and people have to wait a hundred years to see your painting, or you could do incremental detail levels, strategically working on specific areas. Mm -hmm. Maybe you get to see the face before you get to see the body and the face is what you care more about than the body. but you ultimately have to pick what you're working on first. And we've so far picked on, I, I think, a pretty good 
I, I wouldn't really do many things differently if we were to have the benefit of hindsight. I do actually think our strategy has been quite on point. Um, but you know, we've really focused on first building an editor, just like something you can interact with at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so the UI, the buttons, the, the tools, that kind of thing. Then we went on to move towards building the graphics engine. Um, so we replaced some of our temporary vector editing tools that were all just sort of rudimentary vector editing tools with ones that would use the, the node-based graphics engine. Mm -hmm. And that graphics engine, this is Graphene. So Graphite is the editor and the project. Graphene, uh, Graphene is the uh, the engine slash language right. slash, it's, yeah, you could think of it like the Unity editor is Graphite and mm -hmm. the Unity game engine, like the thing that compiles your game is um, you know, the engine here, and that's mm -hmm. equivalent to Graphene. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're building here, two separate technologies. And Graphene is just as ambitious as Graphite. They go mm -hmm. really hand in hand. Um, and we have to build both of them. And Graphene is going to be a, you know, a 20 year kind of project to, re to reach its full final ambitions in the same way that Graphite will grow alongside it. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we can't just build graphics editing without building both of those together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to jump back a little bit. So we talked about node-based editing, and I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but just for anyone who doesn't understand, when we say non-destructive, what do we actually mm -hmm. mean by this? So let's say you are going to draw a shape. Let's say like a, let's say you're making Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. um, so you draw a circle and then you cut out another circle from that circle. You're creating like a pie, or sorry, uh, like a crescent shape. Mm -hmm. um, so you might start out with two circles that you have to draw both of them then you have to cut one out of the other. And the exact position of both circles in relation to each other will result in the final crescent shape that you made. In other graphics editors like Illustrator or Inkscape, if you are going to draw those and then cut one out of the other, doing a Boolean operation to subtract one from the other, that decision about where you placed them, what those shapes look like, whether they were even circles to begin with or if they were some other shape like a star um, or anything you drew with a pen tool, those are all decisions you made. And the operation of cutting one out of the other was a destructive operation. Mm -hmm. You have permanently transformed two layers into another new resulting layer. That operation is ultimately a function. And mm -hmm. in those other pieces of software, uh, in those other pieces of software, you have, uh, you, ha you, you, you perform that function, that operation in the editor once at the very moment you press the button to do it. In Graphite, what that does by comparison, and this is what makes it non-destructive, is that you have added a node to your node graph, which is that function. So that mm -hmm. function that does the operation of cutting one out of the other, it is the, it's encoded into your artwork permanently from that mm -hmm. point. Obviously, you can go delete it, but the operation is not, I made the decision to cut it out once and I've transformed my data permanently and lost the original layers and got a new layer in return. Instead, it is, I have replaced uh, you know, I've I've put together two layers and then combined them into one with basically, if you think of it like a flowchart, because the node graph is basically a flowchart, you take the two layers, make them flow into one layer, uh, make, make, make them flow into one operation. That's the node that does the Boolean operation. And out from that, you get a resulting layer of those two combined. And now, since those are permanently part of your flowchart, unless you delete them or something, um, that operation, now if you go modify the crescent shape, like modify either of the two circles, you can create live, like you know, every frame while you're dragging it around, you see the resulting Pac-Man sh shape or crescent shape or whatever, um, and you can just drag it around live and see it update. So that ends up being really powerful. And then you can go non-destructively add, let's say a bevel or like a round corners kind of operation. Mm -hmm. And that node that provides the round corners can then go and add like a rounding to where the Pac-Man symbol you know, got its, its crescent corners. Um, and then you can still drag around the circles and those crescent you know, the crescent updates and the, uh, and the, sorry, I'm thinking when I say crescent, I, Pac-Man is a pie slice, not a crescent. But anyways, my point remains. <laughs> uh, cutting a triangle out of a circle is what I meant to say this entire time. Mm -hmm. But yes, basically you can update it or even animate. So this is the important part because everything is parameter that, driven. Yes. Exactly. You can animate the opening and closing of the Pac-Man symbol every frame. And then the operation that does the Boolean cutting of one out of the other can animate over time and you get the resulting shape out of that. 